Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to- Wait, are these guys friends? I am Mike, I'm here with my perpetual, maybe I like him one week, maybe I don't, comrade, I'll say for now, Randy. Randy, how's your week been? It's what keeps everybody coming back to find out. <laughs> Will this be the final week of our friendship? I like the idea that one week I decide we are friends, or we're not, and <laughs> or that's not, it. Yeah. That's the last episode. It'll be like a sitcom where they turn the lights off and walk out, and that's the last scene. But it's yeah, going to be just, me turning off my mic and leaving you alone in this record. There is something compelling to a podcast titled, I hate this motherfucker, but like, you know, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what it says about us, by the way. I had two people reach out to me over the last two weeks asking if they could redesign our logo because they hate it. They hate our podcast <laughs> art. And I haven't taken them up on it yet, but they're like, I really like your show. You're, it, it's atrocious. You guys need to do something else. And I was like, oh, I haven't really put that much thought into it. Maybe that's why it's atrocious. I don't know. We are, we yeah, are, we are, we are technicians. We are not uh, creators. Yeah, I, I guess. thought it was a fun idea. Maybe it's not. So it's, it's me looking like a big goof and you looking annoyed at me. And I thought that's the vibe, isn't it? And that's why I felt <laughs> like it worked. That's usually, but, although it seems like as I, it, I've listened back to a couple of the podcasts, just because I love the sound of my own voice because I'm a hopeless yeah, narcissist. Yeah. No, no, but at the, it's, I seem to laugh a lot more, I think, than you do. I laugh at, Certain things, maybe it's just a nervous tick type thing, but uh, it's I, I am more of a giggler, I think, than uh, than you are. That makes sense. No, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll peel the curtain back on my psyche, on my real life, not <laughs> like what I do, just who I am as a person. I don't, something has to be really funny for me to laugh. Like, I love making jokes, I love goofing around, and I will enjoy what we're talking about and be amused by it, right? Mm -hmm. I will, I'm not sitting here like, mm. but... To get me to really laugh, it, it, it takes takes something. I, oh. I don't laugh just at stuff. You know, I'm a snob like that. What yeah, can I say? I'm just easily amused. I'm the, I'm the plebe that's over here that uh, <laughs> does See, not I take think much. Is, the last episode we did, we did the Robert Zemeckis episode uh, that came out last week. I had a couple of really big chortles on things that you said. Did you? Oh, okay. And, and, hey, there we and go. I, I actively noticed. I thought, oh, that's fun. I'm really laughing at something. That's bad nice. courage, you know? I'll take yeah. that. Or bad, you know, it's a bad honor to say, all right, I made Mike laugh. You know, it's funny you mentioned that just because my father is, is similar. He's not a solemn or, you know, not jovial individual, mm -hmm. but just mm -hmm. to get him to really laugh at something is not common. He's just a very mm -hmm. even keel guy. And uh, that's always, I can always remember that growing up. It was, I got him on something. It was just like, yep, <laughs> that's good. That's so I'm nice. glad you can be my father figure on this podcast here, Mike. So. Oh my God. I can never <laughs> Randy, put your tiny hand in mine. Oh boy. Are you pulling out the <laughs> music trivia? Yeah. <laughs> oh God. I, should, I mean, you know who that was. You know who that was. Come on, tell me right now. Who was it? It's George Michael. Come on. Okay, good. I mean, I just. Well, no, I I'm just you, saying, because yeah. it was like a British. Music trivia, oh, right? right? And mostly right. 80s, so it's... I left, I left, uh, I left uh, the cards in the other room. I can go get them. Yeah, there, I got like. you. Uh, we'll bring <laughs> steps back. Let's do it. Oh, God. Five, six, seven, eight. Before we get into our main topics... Yes. Which, which are, you know, not quite deep divey. They're like two medium dives compared to some stuff that we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. I know you were on vacation. You, I saw some of your photos. Uh, they looked wonderful. You went, like, camping and hiking. In this time, in the last week and a half or so, did you watch anything, or was that just not an option? Uh, not while I was where I was, but it was only like five-ish days that we were gone, so I had watched some stuff before. Um, I've been getting into the one main thing on Apple TV, uh, Presumed Innocent, which is the, it's a TV adaptation of technically, I don't know if they're adapting the book or adapting the movie or what they're deciding they're doing, but the, there was a movie with Harrison Ford in the late 80s, or early 90s, adapted from the book. Um, I've read the book and seen the movie, so I was curious to see what they were going to do with it. I only know about the movie because of a reference in an, an obscure Kids in the Hall sketch that I love. <laughs> do you, real quick side, I want you to know, do you remember the Simon and Hecubus characters? Sure. Not, it's like the evil, evil yeah. magicians. There's one when they're talking about how evil they are where he gives away the killer and presumed innocent, and they go, absolutely <laughs> evil! And that's, that's all I can think of. Anyway, I, please continue. Given from the book and the movie, that would be pretty pretty cruel, I would see. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I, I've been noticing, so there have been seven episodes so far. It's an eight-episode. says it's going to be a season, so I don't know how they're going to drag Ooh. it on or if they're just kind of readapting it and going to move on from 
the aftermath of what's happening. Maybe they're changing uh, certain plot points. I, I, I'm not sure. I, it, they have not been hinting at things that give you the turn that happens in the book and the movie. So okay. um, I'll be interested to see what what they end up doing. There's It's coming It's a week-by-week week kind of layout there. Like I said, there have been seven episodes. The next one comes out this week. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. Jake Gyllenhaal is pretty... Uh, I know, unhinged is the wrong word, but he, uh, the, it's, it's volatile, I guess. He, he explodes at times and you're like, whoa, okay, this guy, uh, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, you're saying you don't like that, not his performance. I mean, like he is an unlikable character in the show. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a different portrayal than Harrison Ford did in the movie. That's, I guess I'll put it that way. So it, whereas, uh, Harrison Ford plays it much more as the, Kind of tortured. I can't believe that there there isn't evidence. Why is this turning into? It looks like I did it. Um, where Jake Gyllenhaal, they give a lot more evidentiary type stuff to say maybe he did, <laughs> um, which is which is much different than how the book kind of played out. In the show, is it a mystery mm-hmm. as to if he actually did it or not, or are they saying uh, no, he didn't? But it's just what a burden to prove it. Uh, somewhere in between both of those, I would say. So it's, uh, okay. you, it's, uh, I, again, I don't want to give away the book or the movie. Um, although the movie came out 25 years plus. I mean, hang years on, ago. let's just give a pause. <laughs> Spoiler alert. If yeah. you don't want to know, I don't know, it'll only take 90 seconds. Skip ahead two minutes, let's say. Two minutes exactly. from right now. All right. Tell me right now. Give me your answer. Yes. In more. the book, in the book and in the movie, um, it is his wife that kills his mistress. So, um, okay. which, which is a bit, and it is at the very end yes. and it is a huge turn. Like, and you do not see yeah. it coming. Um, I remember, I, I wasn't sure if you're saying the show went somewhere different because the wife in the movie is also the wife from Die Hard. And, oh, right. uh, she, I remember <laughs> that she did it. So, yeah. So as of right now, and again, they may be made, try to make it out into a multiple season thing. You know, David E. Kelly is kind of the main showrunner for mm-hmm. it so i they, he does that he's known for courtroom drama so maybe they just want to keep maybe the maybe there's an appeal process coming i don't know but um if, wait, has it has it been two minutes yet can we do we talk about something else where are we at <laughs> so yeah Should so we... that's when the aliens came and took jake oh. jillian paul's character away oh, and, wow. uh, no. <laughs> i hope they scored uh scrubbed to right then that's very exciting <laughs> so when no. he got anally probed which he was into he was into it. It's okay. So, but it, um, very, very good. Very, uh, it's very bingeable. They're all 35, 40 minute, you know, kind of that Apple TV sweet spot. Uh, they seem to do for those dramatic ones and, uh, very easy to watch very quickly. I, I, I caught up on three or four episodes in a hurry and then have just been kind of watching it week by week. And it's, um, that's what I've watched and really would recommend and enjoy. Cool. Uh, I didn't watch anything TV wise. I still need to finish the boys. I maybe it's something about the quality of the season. Is I watched the first four episodes and I was feeling the same that a lot of other people have been feeling, where it's not quite as good as the other seasons have been. I want to go back. I just haven't. I I was really getting that placeholder feel, and I just was like, eh, I'll get back eventually. I felt no rush to get back, and I just haven't gone back. Okay. What I did watch is, I got to look up, I had it in my mind, and I forgot who it was. Do you know, if I say the name James Rolfe, do you know who that is? Mm, no. All right, let me try we'll it again. If I, say, if I say the angry video game nerd, do you know who I'm talking about? Mm, I am. Okay. That's out of so, my realm. Sorry. No, it's all good. There's <laughs> there's an amazing documentary from a YouTube channel I highly recommend called Folding Ideas, where every now and again he comes out with these massive deep dives and sometimes into like other YouTube creators and the evolution of the internet and where we were and what we're doing. And James Rolfe, the angry video game nerd, was like a pioneer on YouTube, like one of the first big personality media reviewers. And it's it's a documentary about his inability to stay with the times, the weird cult of personality that arose between people that were his fans and people that aren't, the the vitriol that was putting at him and like his wife when he decided to like focus on having a kid instead of making more videos. And also how he always seemed ashamed about being a YouTuber and always wanted to say he was a filmmaker, but never really grew as a filmmaker. And it's 
it's an amazing it's a weird thing because it's a youtube channel doing a deep dive on another youtuber but not mm. in a gotcha journalism kind of way it's a really insightful thing that almost at the core of it is about people who have aged with the internet people who grew up that this is now a part of their lives mm. and what does it mean to be hitting middle age when you know this is something that had been around your whole time do you have to grow with your audience what do you have to be and it's just it's a really fascinating documentary that you can find on his channel and i watched it and was just absorbed by it interesting and he's done other stuff and he got me because he looks so different in it right and like he seems unkempt and like the guy hosting it and doing all these things and it turns out to all be without giving too much away because it's part of the journey part of how he's presenting it because then he comes back into other areas and he looks how he does in other videos and it's all about evolution and age and things and it's it's, it's a really fascinating breakdown otherwise What's it, what was it called it, the documentary is called i don't know james rolf okay because he doesn't know him but also it comes down to deeper as do we really know anyone that presents themselves on the internet gotcha and it's it's one of those things where this guy's been making internet videos for 15 years does anyone really know him you know that mm -hmm. type of thing and there are people who have that parasocial attachment that think they do and think they're owed things and it's all about that presentation it's it's really interesting i think we've had discussions too that so many things are it dependent upon timing right and so mm -hmm. this is a guy that if he was doing this 30 years ago he was setting up a video camera <laughs> and maybe passing around or it was 40 years ago, whatever. Um, and, you know, maybe these videotapes were passing around to his friends or if it was college, you know, it would go to dorm rooms or other things like that and maybe get peddled through independent shops and stuff like that. But that the, the reach of that would be so much less than the current is. But because this platform existed when he decided to start doing this, it was much more accessible and the reach was much more accessible. And and you're so right about the timing because if he tried to do literally everything identically now, it wouldn't do anything because it's so, so oversaturated. He got in at the right time, was an early person. It's really, and then that's why he talks about evolution and what is popular now versus keeping up and trends and all this. It's like I said, fascinating stuff. Also just been watching a lot of news because the world is insane. Agreed. It, we it don't need to get into it here, no, but the world but, isn't playing. But there is something to that, right? Where it's the and it, I, I think election coverage gets into that in election year too. Not not to to get in one side or the other in terms of or third yeah. side, whatever your whatever your affiliation decides to be. You or heard it here first. Right. RFK Junior. Randy. <laughs> Team, sorry. Well, you said third side. I thought you were trying <laughs> to go there. Oh, uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, um, you're saying... <laughs> no, but you keep anticipating something else to happen you're waiting for something new to happen and i think that that's why i think election night is so engaging too right because you're, you're waiting for what's this state going to be what's this there's there you're pushing towards this 270 number and so you keep seeing updates and you don't want to turn away because you don't want to miss the part of it you want to kind of ha see it as it happens and it was very similar kind of over the weekend as as what transpired we were just waiting to see what the response was going to be from this side, I mean, that's the the point of there's what 435 representatives and there's 100 senators and you know so it, there's a lot of people that will be voicing their opinions or whatever they have to you know chiming in on the matter and so there would to to, to it was hard to tune away turn away because you're just like what else who else is going to chime in when is somebody going to say something? I watch a lot of YouTube, uh, which is why I got to always try to find time to watch actual shows because my mm -hmm. comfort food viewing is youtube videos i watch so much youtube like if i ever if i had to give up a streaming service the last one i'm giving up is youtube premium because i watch so much and i don't want commercials but legal eagles put out a really good video like a day after biden announced he wasn't going to run for re-election all about the legality of um you know campaign donations and who could get this and who could get that and another one worth watching uh also to the fact that he had to have had that one in the chamber because he released a very well produced like slick sheen video less than 24 hours after it was announced so like well, you had that one ready to go didn't you but yeah he so, had it <laughs> maybe he had both ways you know like <laughs> right he was ready to describe uh, each way
it is, some of that stuff it is wild to dive into, right? Just because um, Pete Buttigieg was on Bill Maher's show, the HBO show over the weekend um, on Friday, and he has to be there. He can't say he's there as the transportation secretary because of the Hatch Act. Like it's it's wild all this stuff to go into. He's like like Bill, I think referenced him as that. But he can't but necessarily reference it because I'm here of, in this I'm, official capacity, right? Like yeah. it's campaign finance related and all this other. So it's it's, it's wild the the minutia of that type of it stuff really to, to think about that. The the last thing I'll say on it is all I could think of over the past week, uh, as of when we're recording, because it was only two days ago when we we're recording that everything started going down. Yep. But uh, and with just this, there's been a million other things. It makes me think of South Park after nine eleven when it was just Sharon in a zombie coma on the couch watching the news. And Randy's like, Sharon, you have to turn the news off. Sharon, Sharon, please turn, yeah. Sharon, you need, please turn the news off. You didn't, you need to turn it off. It's, it's, that's all yeah. I can think of with the world. Or as this is not an original thought either. A lot of people have been making this joke, but we've been living through so many unprecedented times. I'd love just a couple of weeks of precedented times we just <laughs> just hang out in the precedented times for a while It'd be real nice can we have a, a boring like jobs report yeah. farm report and uh <laughs> oh man that sounds nice but you know somebody's going to be disappointed this fall in november but we what a segue are going to talk about <laughs> we are going to talk about things that have disappointed us through the Hopefully years not as much as we were by the, the media that we're going to represent oh so. god mm -hmm. i yeah but we've each picked a few films, television shows, possibly other things. I don't know if you've got games or music or what you're looking at. I just but... went three films on mine, but go for it. Yep. Okay. I have one TV show, two films. No. Of... no, I actually have two TV shows, one film. I changed shortly before recording. Gotcha. We're going to okay. talk about disappointing media. Things that we were just so let down by that we were personally hyped by. I think a lot of these are also probably universally derided. I don't know if there's going to be a few that we were let down by that everyone else is like, no, I loved it. The, the, there's probably not going to be a lot of hot takes in this one, but there's still going to be fun to talk about just sure. what we got into, wh why we felt the way we felt. Because this is, if nothing else, a podcast about our deep feelings. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're, we're talking disappointing media. Emote Randy, would you like me. to start Emote us off with, with me, your... Mike. No, uh, yes. I would love to take a deep dive into your emotions and give me your first one you want to talk about that just really let you down and why. So I'm just going to go chronological here because that seems to be the easiest way. There's no, I, I want to say there's any level of disappointment here. I was just really kind of re excited and interested and thought it was like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. And it just wasn't. And that's, I think, the level of, of deep disappointment from me. And I'm going to start with 2003's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Which, Ooh, that's uh, a good choice. That's a yeah. really good choice. And uh, I because I didn't read the comics candidly, but I know Alan Moore, right? That's the guy's name? Um, yep. Okay. Well, he hates everything he's ever that has ever been adapted, <laughs> which is hilarious because he's agreed to it. But he's a miserable fuck if you ever read yeah. his interviews. Yeah. He's a miserable fuck. Even the did because I watched the on Max the Killing Joke that that adaptation. Oh, that was fucking did. terrible. That was yeah, a terrible very, adaptation. So, so he's right to say, I guess, to say that <laughs> that wasn't good Real either. Real quick so, aside, I'm going to derail you because now I have to talk yes. about the Killing Joke. Okay, all right. That. They, for years, Mark Hamill had said, I'm going to retire as the Joker unless we do the killing joke. So they mm -hmm. finally said, we're going to do the killing joke. They got Mark Hamill back to be the Joker, who is the definitive Joker. They got Kevin Conroy a couple years before he died to be Batman again. It's everything you wanted. The problem was the killing joke is a very, very small, short graphic novella. It's great, but it is small. It is short. What That was never going to be able to be adapted into a feature-length film. The, if they had done a truly good, faithful adaptation, it's a short film. Mm. And you can still release and sell a short film when the fans want to see it. But they decided they needed to pad it out to be an hour and a half movie. So there's like an hour and 15 of shit they made up. And then the last half hour is the killing joke. So it's deeply terrible. But anyway. That makes a lot more sense now, not knowing that context, but just because I remember thinking that just like, boy, this is slow. Um, the, <laughs> the and, first and, and not great. Hour plus was made up for the movie. Yeah. So yeah, so it's lame. deeply terrible. <laughs> yes. Anyway, please tell me your 
thoughts on League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. The movie that made Sean Connery retire. The movie that made Sean Connery stop acting. That's that's all you really need to know. And uh, there is a couple wild things from that, just like side trivia, that he had turned down Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, which that deal essentially would have, he would have signed on for part of the profits of it. And he basically... I think I've shoot I've seen different numbers, but it has basically turned away between three hundred and fifty and four hundred million dollars if he had paid it off in Lord of the Rings, which is wild. Amazing. And I, I'm blanking on the other. There was one other I know the other one. He he turned down the role of the architect in the Matrix right. sequels. Exactly. Which admittedly is probably a better decision, but those yes. movies still made a lot of bank. It would have been kind of fun in his hands, I think. So it'd been interesting. It could have, but he did say, yeah, that the thing is, is, and if you're about to say this, I apologize. I, I'm stealing your trivia fact because I know it also. He said famously, he was like, he only took the League of Extraordinary Gentleman role because he didn't understand it. And the last two things he didn't understand were blockbuster mm. hits. So he literally took it because he's like, I don't get this. And clearly I'm barking up the wrong tree. So sure, why the fuck not? Let's do it. And 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 to, to set the stage for anybody that doesn't know League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's just it it is, I, I guess, crime fighters of sorts that are literary characters. So that that is that is man, is that essentially a fair assessment of it? Yeah, like it's, you know, it's a, it's it's all your your famous in the you know in the comics and in the movie to some degree. It's all your famous characters from like your Jules Verne, your H.G. Wells, your Bram Stoker. You know, Arthur Conan Doyle, all the famous novel characters that you think of. Alan Quartermain, Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Yep. Hyde. Dorian uh, Gray, They're isn't all it? Yep. Uh, Dorian Gray, Mina Harker from Dracula. They're all in it. The only one that was added for the movie because they because it was always a British property was Tom Sawyer was never once in the comics. They added Tom Sawyer for the gotcha. to have an American on the team. Okay. I don't know. It, it, it's something that it, at the time, I this is right after the first two X Men movies, right? This is right after at least one, if not two, of the Spider Man movies. You know, so I'm whatever early twenties. Randy is like, I like superhero movies. I like British actors. I like adventure. This movie looks great. Like <laughs> when you see the premise and you see you see the trailers, like you're really really excited about it. And it just gets so convoluted. And I think it suffers too. I don't want to take anything away from the remainder of the actors other than Connery in it, but it is readily evident that because he, I think that he, they was, he got 17 million for it and that affected their budget to try and get other actors for it. And I think it's evident in most of that. I would say the Jason Fleming would be probably the only one. I think that I really enjoy the Jekyll and Hyde. Um, I think his his scenes are the most compelling uh, beyond uh, or his bits, I guess, whatever. But once it starts getting towards the end of this movie, you know, and they're going again, spoiler alert, I guess. I, I, um, Listen, just accept that we're in a to people need to just accept that every movie we're going to talk about and most of these shows have been over for at least a decade. So, ever just accept you're going to get fucking spoiled. We're saying it now. Uh, one of mine's not like six or seven years, but anyway, uh, the Ooh, but yes, bold. yeah, to understand that. And it shouldn't be a real surprise that you know, M is actually Moriarty or whatever, and so he's the bad guy. Oh, god, what, what, are, what are the odds that you know the defining villain from Sherlock Holmes is, is the one that ends up being the villain? But but then once you get towards the end, it's kind of like everybody kind of kills everybody, which is weird. It has a very Hamlet ending to it, and uh, it's, which is probably decrying Hamlet, but the it. It doesn't, there's no thread through the whole thing. It just feels like stuff keeps happening, and then the movie is sort of over, where uh-huh. Sean Connery maybe comes back to life. <laughs> That's the other weird part of the very end, is that, like, do they reincarnate him, or do they bring him back from the dead because they have this other African witch doctor? I don't know. Um, There's they're just so much of this movie that, looked so fun and slick and cool and everything I'd read about that uh, people mm-hmm. were very excited about it that had read the comics. I had a couple friends who had read it and were really excited about this being a franchise they thought that could be 
more than one movie and because the movie was so bad obviously they just cut it off at the past and it's uh and i the weird part is too i i like <laughs> um i like watchmen i didn't see the uh not watchmen um kingsman oh and, yeah, yeah. I like kingsman. and uh especially the first one and it, I thought it was, you know, looking back after seeing Kingsman, I thought I was like, this is what League of Extraordinary Gentlemen should have been like something that has that stylized well, so slick, that vibe, you know, just and with a little bit of tongue in cheek. But, you know, it's OK that it's overly violent. Like if, you know, it, it it's because it, it sort of works in that in that kind of thread. So I, I, I that that's my first one because I didn't. And it's it, beyond Connery's performance. Uh, he didn't get along with the director, so you could tell that he was being. <laughs> uh, and like you said, it made him stop acting. It's it. I didn't make him stop acting, but I wanted to talk about that a little bit because I don't know why. I know this movie was not well received. It killed Stephen Norrington's directing career. He directed Blade, which was amazing. Then he directed this. And he never directed another movie ever again. And I was like, is this really such a travesty? I would have given him another movie. Was he, wh why, why did this movie kill his career so badly? I know it's not great, but is it really, was it really that much of a nightmare that, that he was blackballed? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're, well, but you could easily make a franchise kind of, not superhero adventure movie. I mean, what? Who's not to say that you couldn't find another franchise that he could work that was in this sort of stylized look, like a Blade? What's what's the Kate Beckinsale one? Um, I'm, I'm blank. That's placed on. Uh, 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 the, the, I know you're those movies are fucking terrible. Right, but I mean, uh, that, that, there, there's no reason that he couldn't be on one of those. You know what I mean? Oh, like, is, 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 those is, movies are so I'm, bad. I'm not saying he should be. He would be in a good movie, but you know, like maybe a someone trying to get something and be like, well, this guy made Blade. You know? Okay, fair enough. But that fair it, enough. It never right. happened, and so it. I, I think it also suffered from the fact that, and when I did a little more research <laughs> on it that they shot a lot of this in Prague and there was this unseasonable rainfall and floods that destroyed a lot of the big mm. set pieces that they had for it. And so it just, the budget kept going up and up and up because they had to completely rebuild, you know, these like five, six million dollar set pieces. Um, and it, it just, it, it, I wonder if that contributed a little bit to some of it, but also just the, the story the story is just kind of muddled and all over the place. I I wrote in my notes, it's a dizzying to try and keep up with it all. And that's what it feels like. You're just, there's stuff going on, especially in the last like half hour of the movie. You're just like, whoa, here, 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 here. And then all this stuff happens. Your pick ties into my first pick. And I feel like we can actually talk about these sort of in tandem for part of this. My first pick is going to be 2006's X-Men The Last Stand. So, the the reason I was going to say it kind of ties in, because obviously there's things that doom both movies independently, but also there is something that happened post Spider-Man and I'd say X2, which came out in 2003 as well. But it was, oh my God, superheroes are making bank, but it was before they knew how to really do them, right? So there's this thing from about 2003 to 2000, I would say even 10, because Iron Man came out in 2008 and that they had to start figuring out the formula. But there was a five or six, seven year period where some are really good. You get your Batman Begins, your Dark Knight, your Iron Man. And then there are some that are this and Ghost Rider. And it's just they didn't know what to do. And they were also scared to commit to the material. Every one of these early 2000s superhero movies is scared to go full superhero. Like, they don't want to say, let's just do what the comics does. It clearly worked. They have to figure out, but how can we make it for the movie? That's too much for a movie. How can we do this for a movie? And all of these properties suffer because of it. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you can feel it. And then things start, you know, with the tide, obviously, starts to turn with Iron Man, right? Like that, because mm -hmm. Marvel starts to figure it out. And and I know that obviously down the road becomes its own thing because now we've become homogenized yeah. with the formula. Right. But there's that there's there's a sweet spot from kind of that ten years of Iron Man into Endgame where there was still some experimentation going on and things going on. But it was we found it. But right now, you know, two thousand three, 
and when I, mine's coming out in 2006, both of those movies are coming out in the wilderness years. You know, like we we don't know. We know they make money, but they don't always make money. But sometimes they do. But then people are angry. Yeah. Like they can't figure it out and they don't know why it's working and why it's not. So anything you want to say else on this movie before I hit some x the Last Stand? Uh, no, I think. And now I'm looking it up real quick just to see because I think there will be a similar uh, what it actually made. Um, hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was really reading. It made a good, healthy profit, right. but it was so derided <laughs> that because that's the other thing about it coming out in this era. It's pre big internet, pre internet, yeah. pre reviews, pre this, pre that. You're still in an era where you have to go off the trailer and the trailer didn't look terrible. Yeah. It's Sean Connery. It looks fun. These movies are going to make money. That's how the kind of even kept happening. Because people hadn't quite cottoned on to the fact that, oh, these are going to be real hit and miss. Yep. Because you couldn't figure it out ahead of time quite yet. And it was still the time of like movies being a really big thing to do. So it's a, it, yes. it, but it, it made at least a hundred grand, I think, from what I was looking at. A hundred grand, a hundred million dollars. <laughs> it did make at least a hundred grand. grand, yeah. grand yeah, I just looked it up. Yeah, uh, domestically 179. So on a, on a, seven, okay. on a 78 million dollar budget. So I made a hundred million dollars and that's 20 years ago. So, but it, I think a lot of people went and saw it with the excitement for it and came away with the same. There was not many, if any, repeat viewings of this. And it's probably why I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theater. Because it's just like, I even if it was on, I'm like, I'm not going to watch this crap. I know I saw it in the theater. And I think maybe I've seen it one time since then on like sci-fi channel or some fucking late night (laughs) bullshit. You know what I mean? Where it it was on. But. I've already mentioned disappointing media. We're talking, I've clearly had disappointing media happen before 2006, right? Batman and Robin was bad. You know, (laughs) this was bad. Other things that I didn't like. I think, you know, I I think I walked out in like 2004 of House of the Thousand Corpses. Sure. But at the time, in the era of superhero movies becoming a thing, as we've been talking about, X2 was the best thing I'd ever seen, ever. It was before Spider-Man 2, sure. and I still personally, as an X-Men fan, I think liked X2 more. Agreed. It was breathtaking. And let's forget the Brian Singer of it all for the moment. We're going to forget that he's a terrible human being who's done terrible things. We didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it in 2003. I just loved X2. X2 mm-hmm. is fucking brilliant. It's everything I wanted, even with the changes from the comics. The hype level I had as a comic book fan, <laughs> as a movie fan, coming into X-Men 3... And it was early internet enough that I'd heard rumblings and was a little nervous because you heard about how, oh, did you hear the guy who directed the second one left and he went to go do Superman? Oh, that's weird. I'm not really that excited for Superman. Oh, did you hear the guy who plays Cyclops left to do the Superman movie with him? Is he in this one? You know, it's Mm. like a lot of that. We don't have the internet to tell us this exactly happened. Yeah. But we have the internet where we're like, you hearing this? Did you see this? (laughs) Is, Is that real? You know? And I'm like, huh, okay, that's going to be, whatever, the trailers look amazing. This looks great, because all the characters in the trailer, let's ignore the fact it turns out the only scene Cyclops is in, but he's in the trailer. It's like, okay, this is, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm fucking hyped. I was in my third year working my first TV job, local news. It was a midnight show. It was the 11 o'clock news over at 1130. There was a sports game. We might have gone late. I was so pins and needle. It was before you could do uh, pre-assigned seating. So I had mm-hmm. my friends, I lived close to, I worked close to the theater. I had my friends saving me a seat. I was going to hightail it as soon as the show ended. I told people, because we normally had to finish the show and like clean the studio and reset things. I looked at them and I went, this is my solid. I'm gonna, You're going to do me. I'll, I'll stay another night. I'll do something yeah. for you another night. This show's over. I am running to <laughs> Celebration <laughs> Cinema in Lansing, Michigan. I am <laughs> hightailing it. I'm getting it for the show get in i sit down oh my god i made it It was like 10 minutes before it starts oh my god i'm so excited this is gonna be so amazing oh fuck me what a terrible movie this is i just i i i just can't with like i need you to understand how excited i was and how like i i I read the synopsis again watched some clips this morning i just want to hit the quick downer points First off, Brett Ratner took over directing from Brian Singer. 
You went from bad person but creative to bad person and bad director. <laughs> but it was it was after rush hour. Yeah. And so he was a big deal. But he brought his frenetic lack of storytelling to this sequel. And the reason why is Brian Singer didn't want to not make the movie. He wanted to make Superman he'd been offered, then come back and make this. Right. And this isn't in an era where they're going to let you do that. Nowadays, I think if like James Gunn had been, hey, Marvel, I'm still going to work with you. Let me make my Superman movie. And then I'm going to come back and do another Marvel. They'd be like, great, let's sign you up. That We don't have time for that in 2006. <laughs> we have a release date. And we're going to fucking hit it. Yeah. We got, you know, let's go. And then, you know, th that falls apart. So the original yep. story, which is going to be a much more faithful Dark Phoenix adaptation, falls apart. All these extra plot lines get put in. And here's what I've got. I wrote the bad. 2006 era de-aging on Ian McKellen mm -hmm. and Patrick Stewart <laughs> off the top. They look like smooth plastic <laughs> dolls. It's terrible. The... <laughs> uh, Holly Berry, A Storm was never that good, but she got bigger and bigger roles because it was an era where she was famous. But her expanded role in this is deeply terrible. She doesn't act like Storm. She has a white hair and a cape, and she just yells at everybody. No, no Logan. No, no. It's terrible. Wolverine and Jean try to form the dramatic arc of this movie and their relationship, but it makes no sense because even in the comics, it's only a flirtation. Here, it acts like the biggest, deepest emotional connection. But if you look at the literal canon of the movie, he's known her like six months at best. Mm. Everything in this movie that he does should be Cyclops. Right. Because of the emotional stakes and the arc and everything. But it's the Hugh Jackman of it all, especially in that era. They depower Mystique. They kill Cyclops. They kill Xavier. There's too many plots. The best character in X2 introduced, Alan Cumming as Nightcrawler, Depth, nuance amazing performance great special effects not in the movie not even mentioned so <laughs> it's it's not even like why is he here no, no. he is mentioned in the surprisingly good game that has nothing to do with the movie they just made a game called x-men the last hand and they just like we're gonna make a game that has nothing to do with this terrible movie quite good okay. surprisingly good <laughs> you can only play as three characters and you alternate levels it's Iceman, Wolverine, and Nightcrawler, and they just made a fun X-Men game oh. that has nothing to do with this terrible movie. There you go. And then I will throw out, there was some good in the expansion of the team, bringing in new members. All the students had grown up and become X-Men. I liked that. And the opening scene for that is kind of fun. Then the rest of the movie happens. And then Kelsey Grammer as Beast is amazing. He's wasted, but he's so good, and he's so perfect that he's brought back in that 10-second cameo in Days of Future Past, and then he voices him in that weird CGI version in the after credit scene for the Marvels. Right. Like, he was that good that he has stayed, sort of like Patrick Stewart, the eternal memory for who that character sure. should be. But everything else about it is terrible. <laughs> I, I know I went on a rant. I had a lot of notes there. Is there anything you want to say on this one? No, I, I think that was pretty much the universal, especially if you had any inkling or enjoyment of whether it was the comics, whether it was the cartoon, whether it was, you know, you played the video games. I think even that lends itself. You had some sort of semblance of enjoying the superhero team that is the X-Men. Um, you felt like the adaptations were like the first one gave it some good footing. And then the second one, like you said, was incredible. And it's like, OK, sometimes the third one's not always going to be. It wasn't that it was. Not as good as X2, because that is a lofty, lofty goal. It was that right, it was right. so bad. And so just it yes. disjointed. And They, and just... they clearly rushed it out. Yep. They clearly wanted to hit that release date. We don't care what happens. Cyclops is on Superman terms. You can get him for a day. Kill him. Kill Xavier. Right. Kill Jean Grey. Kill, like... And that's another part of the, the problem with the movie. Yeah. Emotionally, as a fan... Not even as a fan, like, watching the movie... You're really not following a lot of the characters you followed in the first two. Wolverine's in it. Storm's kind of in it. Magneto's kind of in it. And instead, you're following all... Like, it's... It was almost like it was made for action figures, you know? Mm. And then they're just going to kill all these people. And it's, it's just really rough. I just... I don't... When does... When does uh, Professor X die? I think like two thirds of the way through okay. the whole last act, and it was not. It. I, well, it's because I mentally check out like after that. Like I remember when I saw yeah. that, I'm just like I, I was still not shell shocked, but just like you're gonna be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, and and then you wait for it to be undone, and it kind of is in the after credits, I but guess, not really. Yeah. And but it's it's uh, and also it's the reason why it's it's also narratively unnecessary. 
they're not motivated right. by it. They're, they they have the same stakes that they would have had whether or not he lived or not. No. Him living or dying has nothing to do with the fact they need to stop what's going on. There's no stakes. They just start killing him to act like it's a big moment, and it's really not. Mm -hmm. It's confusing and dumb. But yeah, that's good. <laughs> hey, good times. Good times. <laughs> You know, what's important is in this time of turmoil in the country, we're doing an episode that makes us angry. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, <laughs> we're venting. We're, we're like, we're, you know, we're purging our, <laughs> our, our, our vitriol. For anyone listening now that isn't always in on the superhero stuff, that was my only superhero pick. Mm. I, I could have gone more because you also look at the fact that this franchise ruined Superman <laughs> because it killed Superman Returns because neither movie got the focus it should have gotten. But that's my only superhero pick. I don't know if you did any more. If, if you want to call mine uh, like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen a superhero pick, that's the only one I did. Uh, that's the only one I let did. Let me rephrase. So. A, I guess I could say a comic book pick gotcha. in theory. Randy, go ahead and head for your next All one. All right, so I'm going to jump to 2011. <laughs> it was the comedy mm. question mark. David Gordon Green's uh, directorial uh, comedy with James Franco and Danny McBride called Your Highness. I don't know if you remember this movie. Oh, I forgot about that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was at the height. I mean, this is two years after Pineapple Express. This is right in the thick of Eastbound and Down. This is James Franco can do no wrong. We talked about James Franco's uh, uh, fall from grace. Uh, but it, it, the... You look at the cast, and basically the, the the premise of the movie is sort of a medieval. I mean, think of yeah, what Monty Python, and the Holy Grail meets Pineapple Express, kind of the stoner version of that. That's kind of that sounds like a sell, right? Right. Like, that's for kind the of right. I, maybe not for everybody, but for the right kind of comedy fan. Oh my god, that that felt like. And I, I was a big fan. I liked Pineapple Express. I liked you know he was also in This Is the End. Like there's just a bunch of stuff that Danny McBride is really funny in. That I enjoy his, he's not for everybody, but I really think he's funny and really, really enjoy his characters, especially that are just convinced that they are much better than they are, but then accept sort of the humility of that, like start to realize that they're not as good as they are and they need help from others to attain what's going on. But still, uh, the, them fighting to get there is almost kind of petulant, but still really funny. I, I, I've seen, I've heard many times on multiple movies that Danny McBride is on. I think This is the End is the most famous one that it is really hard to get through scenes with him if it's improv because he is just that funny. Like, he's, like, far and away the funniest guy in the room. It's interesting. So looking at this, I see it definitely didn't do well. It's it's interesting for him, for me, I like a lot of things that he is in, but he is almost universally my least favorite part of any project he's involved with. Okay. I, I, like, I love Righteous Gemstones, and some of the stuff he's done in that is good, but his comedy scenes almost never do it for me. And I've also loved his stuff more as he has evolved emotionally from he's kind of down to vice principles to righteous gemstones mm -hmm. as it's gotten better and better. And he's gotten a little more artistic, but if you were to just put him like your classic, you know, frat pack style movie, he is historically my least favorite part of any of them. Okay. Yeah. So this may not have been something you were clamoring to go see in any way. No, I only ever saw it on TV. I thought it sucked. I never wanted to see it. <laughs> Uh, I was really excited for it because I just I thought the premise was funny kind of a, you know not fish out of water but just something that where there are a lot of things that are poking fun at the the times the situation sort of the ridiculous nature of the fantasy genre uh, medieval genre um, that sort of thing and I think that's and you look you look at the cast I mean James Franco Danny McBride Zoe Deschanel's in it Natalie Portman Justin Thoreau Damian Lewis from Homeland and and uh, Billions uh, Toby Jones is in it. Charles Dance, the uh, patriarch from uh, the Targaryens, or not Targaryens, the Lannisters uh, in Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just it's and and like I said, in a real hot streak for David Gordon Green, just uh, as a director, and for this just to not, I I, I don't know. I, I maybe you're right that it just it was something that it just wasn't a good movie. And that was ultimately why it wasn't. I was just really trying to hope and lean into the fact, oh, maybe this is a funny thing. And if something was only slightly funny, I'm like, okay, here we go. And then it never went anywhere. I just wondered if, why didn't they lean more into the obscurity? That was kind of the insanity of Pineapple Express is that like all these different things in this relatively nothing storyline were happening around them is like, we'll lean into that maybe a little bit more. Does it need to have a plot that 
has an arc <laughs> just make it just make it crazy just do just do whatever and have it maybe me it would be funnier if it's just a series of uh, a bunch of dumb jokes fair enough which inch to to your credit uh, i love monty python and the holy grail there's barely a plot yeah. in that movie the plot is they walk across the country and things happen to them yeah. and it's just skits and bits so and then yeah, the movie just ends right. <laughs> it's like it, it, yeah. just, it just gets stopped by the cops when I was, the first time I ever saw that, I was in like ninth grade and it blew my mind. But I also remember like being confused and a little angry at the movie. Being like, but I was enjoying it so much. <laughs> and now it's, wait, wait I want to, I, they had invested me enough where I wanted a resolution. Yeah. And they didn't give it. And I was like. <laughs> That's on their terms. Uh, Everything no, on their terms. It... That was the brilliance of Monty Python. <laughs> But yeah, I, 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 we joke and reference periodically our frat pack episode that never got released because the <laughs> record was corrupted. And I know we didn't talk about this movie there, but that era yep. and those people and a lot of what's going on here, this is kind of, if not a height, it's, is it the height? This is the height of the frat pack era, right? When they, that's how they could get a project like this made. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe a couple of years before, but yeah, it's within the range mm -hmm. that it still had juice to get this going. Yeah. But um, anything else you want to say? Because I got nothing else to say. I didn't care for no, it. No, I mean, we I talked no, about how it's disappointing. No. I was really, because I loved uh, Eastbound and Down. And <laughs> um, I, I, like I said, the, the movies that these guys were all in, I really, really enjoyed. And it was kind of fun. It, even Natalie Portman is probably the bright spot of this movie just because of the, uh, the back talking badass warrior that's looking to avenge her her family's death mm -hmm. by the hands of the wizard and uh it's she's an interesting kind of back and forth with danny mcbride but um it that part at least was sort of cast well but the rest of it it just didn't it just doesn't work it's just not as funny it, it, i felt like it could be really really funny and it just wasn't yeah that's fair i buy that um i guess if we're doing chronologically i will move to I can't say one episode or one season. I'm going to frame this as the decline of Dexter. Mm -hmm. Like the show, I loved Dexter. The first four seasons are near flawless TV. Even people don't like like the Jimmy Smith season, I think sometimes. I mm, love that season. That's good. Season three, yeah. I think, is quite Nothing good. beats the Trinity like season, Dexter. but like it's... Oh, yeah, no. I mean... And that's the problem too, is that's season four, yeah. right? And then everyone was hyped for five. And I, here's the thing. I don't hate five of the later of the post Trinity seasons. It's the best one. It's, it's the one with, yeah. um, oh, see, that Lumen you know, or was that stuff. Colin Hanks? Or was yeah, that? It's, Lumen. Okay. it's Lumen. The Lumen season, I think is the best one post Trinity. And listen, I, I don't want to get detailing all the seasons of Dexter. And if you don't know what Dexter is, just fucking Google it. I'm not going to detail right. the seasons of Dexter for you right now, but <laughs> They had such a high point with the death of Rita and with John Lithgow and all these things that the momentum, they've never had more momentum. I mean, they could have ended there, season. honestly. Like, I, it... Yeah. Yep. And then the fifth season was fine enough. Yeah. It was not, oh, what happened? I thought it was okay. The sixth season went off a cliff so fucking fast. And and then uh, I believe Colin Hanks, I believe, is the seventh season. Okay. What was the sixth and, season, sixth then? Sixth season, it is the one with Yvonne Stravowski from Chuck and Hannah oh, showing up for the first time. Right. The Poisoner? And, and Yes, exactly. Yeah, that season's She's awful. In, <laughs> it's just as bad as that yeah. last one. Yep. And then, then obviously, the finale is well Ugh. talked about. The fact that, and it's, listen, you talk about Breaking Bad, and then you talk about the Dexter finale, and these are not original thoughts. I know I'm hitting the same points some people hit. But you want to look at Breaking Bad did it perfectly, and Dexter did it as opposite of that as you could even imagine. Breaking Bad not only gave, they gave you what you wanted to see, but also in a narratively compelling, tense way. You wanted to see what happened when everyone found out. You wanted to see him get caught. You wanted to see him do this. You wanted this, and they gave you every moment you wanted but with just enough twists, turns, and tension to never make you think it was predictable or we're hitting the final motions. Sure. Dexter went the other way, where they just went 
all those things you want, we're not going to do one fucking <laughs> lick of them. Not one lick. No consequences. No one's finding out. He's getting away with it scot-free. He's going to survive. It was like, do you fucking hate us? Right. Like, you you know what you've been... We've been invested for eight seasons to see the moment it all falls apart. We're enjoying the ride, but you know the promise of this was when he gets caught and it all falls apart. And how is that going to go? And then they just didn't fucking do it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck you. And, so, and for some reason, like, talk this through with me, like, to try to figure out when Dokes almost did, and I don't remember what season that yes. was. To, season two. Was that only two? Okay, that's why. All right. Yeah. Um, But that was, that, that felt like, okay, this is, he's towing the line here. Like, it felt like you could get one yeah. mulligan, right? Like, you got yes. one good, like, lucky break. <laughs> um, yep. And, but now it's, it needs to be even more so. So and, now you're right. And you're right because season two, that was great with Dokes for that season, especially because I don't think you could have done a third or fourth season with Dokes going, I suspect you motherfucker. <laughs> like, like, okay. You know, like they had to figure He's, out a way that like you can't, that was unsustainable. That was you roughly know? 40% of his lines were, I suspect you motherfucker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. He loves us. So oh, surprise motherfucker. Do you remember that old vine? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember? Vine. Do you remember Vine? Oh, <laughs> fries, mother! Do you remember yeah. the Vine where it was all the Dokes variations? <laughs> fries, motherfucker! <laughs> Flies, motherfucker! It's good for the kids. Vine was before TikTok. I there are no kids that listen to this. It's, yeah, <laughs> four feels like such a tragic ending. Where yes, he didn't get caught and he didn't get away with it, but it would have left such a people always wondering and such a dramatic ending or a even if he never got caught now he has to live with this guilt and torment At it would have worked as a trinity ending. got the best of him i mean that's the you know yep. like if you make your life into whether it's morally correct <laughs> to to yep. eliminate the the bad people of the world i mean it's you're taking another person's life uh, <laughs> that, you know I, it's fascinating i, I just said john lithgow was so i that's one of the great performances of the last like 20 whatever years what is um dexter's partner that becomes a captain uh uh uh, uh, uh angel, angel right angel yeah which that is oh my god so that's part of why i hate the last season or two as well randomly his like niece or something right. is just a regular character who's just hanging around for no reason and it's like you know we don't give a fuck about any of these people it's it so, she's like, only there so... to uh babysit harrison that's like her only reason yes. for being around like <laughs> overnight after... sometimes it's like yeah. all right yeah <laughs> oh god it was so bad no well, really that's another reason it probably should have ended a season four because you have the burden now of he has a baby and that might sound like a fun narrative thing but it becomes this hang up for them yeah. being able to tell the stories they want to tell it's but uh, angel uh, and my only quick tie to it is that he plays the husband of one of the characters in the bear which you find out this season of the bear which is really cool and i was just like oh angel <laughs> i hadn't seen him in a long time <laughs> well all right what do you got for your what third and final my third and final pick um and should not probably be a surprise when i say it um because pretty universally <laughs> Uh, not liked, but I'm picking from 2018 the Happy Time Murders. Oh, that was so disappointing. Just, You're right. Uh, oh my like, goodness. I was ready for a raunchy, gritty Muppet movie. You know, I was ready for maybe it didn't even have to be like crazy over the top. I mean, they made such a big deal about oh, it's an R-rated Muppet movie. Okay, well, we'll see what happens here. Um, I was like, could this be like Roger Rabbit but more edgy, or could this be yeah. maybe is this Team America slash South Park meets Muppets? Okay, I'm 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 in. Like maybe there'll be something here. The Muppets are so irreverent, they're so stilly or clever, or, or you know they they have these little side jokes, and like maybe you just bring that, and then all you're doing is adding the raunch to it. You're adding something that's a little more maybe or violent or whatever, but still has that mm -hmm. little Muppet I don't know twinkle in your eye, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it. Yep. And uh, the fact it was directed by Jim Henson's son, right? Like, and it, I, it seemed like it had things in place that had me really interested. And, and, and Melissa McCarthy, the giant at the time, you know, just like huge, huge star carrying a whole bunch of different things. And <laughs> then it just ultimately the whole movie is just putting Muppets in adult situations. There's no hook. There's no clever, like, 
side, you know, like there, there's nothing to set it up. It's just like, oh, they're going to ejaculate string. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, that that's yeah. the jokes. No. Like I and and just I. I, I don't know. I was also it, it was equally disappointed. Grosser, this is a great pick. Grosser shock value posing as humor. That's what I wrote. Like, and that just feels like every joke. That's all it is. It's like, oh, isn't it funny to hear a muppet say fuck? So I have a thought on this, and that I, I want to talk about a slightly different property, but it's the best ex- other example of this I can think of. The reason I think we love the Muppets the way that we do, is they're they ride that line. And the problem is the part of the appeal is the ride of that line. Mm. It's the same reason we loved Ren and Stimpy in the 90s. Right. But when they tried to do the adult revival of Ren and Stimpy, it was deeply terrible because the comedy came from the middle ground. The comedy comes from riding that line. And just like you, I was as excited about <laughs> this movie. That's a great pick. But it was watching it and thinking about it later and equating it to some of these other properties where I realized... The appeal is in that they don't cross that line. It is the asides. It's the winks. It's the knowing. It's the nods. And I this helps me to realize that because them crossing that line was like, oh, bleh. Yeah. But then also I wonder, to your point, could they have crossed the line if they were something more creative about it? Right. I think that's it. It feels like a, you know, you talk about stand-up comedians that say it brings certain jokes up because they plant the idea in your head and you're, you know, the the best right. ones are when the audience is like a half a step ahead of you because they know where you're going with it as opposed to just saying something filthy or crude or vulgar. Yes. No, ex- I, I, excellent pick. So and, two, yeah, two things real quick. I'll let you get to yours. Just, I mean, there's not a lot to say about it. Just if you haven't seen the movie, I would not recommend you go do it. Um, But <laughs> uh, there are two reviews here. So, Jess Fenton from Switch, which is a movie. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure what Switch is, but anyway, this was on. <laughs> I assumed it was some sort of online magazine, yeah. considering that this movie came out in the 2010s. And it says something similar to, I adore the concept. I love the cast. The fact that this was directed by Jim Henson's son made me giddy, and yet I did not like this movie. Hate is too strong a word. However, I was deeply disappointed, underwhelmed. My sides were left unsplit. So that's just a, a perfect yes. encapsulation of it. Rolling Stone's review I liked even more, where it says, A few critics are calling this the worst movie of the year. Unfair. The Happy Time Murders, an R-rated look at a serial killer running wild in a puppet populated in Los Angeles, has what it takes to be a contender for worst film of the decade. So, huh. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, you're, you're so right, by the way, about you wanted it to be a Team America type movie. Right. Um, because that movie is vulgar, crass, gross, and hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's all about the approach, the tone, the execution. And believe me, I realized that that you got Trey Stone and Matt Parker or Matt Park no. Trey yeah, Trey Matt. Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yes. I did that. Hey, too. the South Park guys did it. <laughs> so yeah, I uh it's a it's a different pedigree, but my goodness, you know. That's my and that's my third one. <laughs> All right, my my third one is another cliched one. Uh, you got a really good deep cut there that I love. That's a great pick. Mine is as cliche as possible, but it's to the point where I still can't watch reruns of this show. And I used to binge this show. It used to be a comfort show. While it was still on, I would rewatch seasons on Netflix and just love it. How I Met Your Mother. The finale, specifically, even the last season, is great. This show was so good from top to bottom until the last half hour. And it's just, and it, it undid so much goodwill. And that finale upset me to such a point. I have not watched, when did, when did the show go off the air? How I Met Your Mother finale. How I Met Your Mother went off the air in... Give me a year, damn it. 20... 2014. 14, huh? How I Met Your Mother went off the air in March 2014, and I have not watched an episode, therefore, in over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Not a rerun, not a let's give it another shot. It still hurt too much. <laughs> it's so disappointing. It's such a letdown. I and, and the fact, have you seen the alternate ending that they released a couple of years ago? online no i don't think so they 
they released an alternate ending where Ted and Robin don't get together. It felt so much more true that to That needs the to be the ending, yeah. And it felt, and watching the alternate ending felt right. The alternate ending is what I wanted the canon ending to be. Right. The problem is, is I don't know what trivia you've seen. The stuff with the kids, they shot in season two when Ted and Robin were together. And so they shot the ending with the kids talking about Aunt Robin seven years before they knew what the finale was going to be. Huh. And so they felt like they were pigeonholed into using that. Yeah. And that's fine. Maybe you are, but I guess maybe you don't have to. Maybe you can get around it somehow. I don't know. But also, maybe don't shoot just one scene with the kids. <laughs> maybe shoot if you know you're going to do that. If you're like, these kids are aging out. Let's shoot the finale with them. Maybe shoot a generic version. Yeah. Shoot a catch-all version. Shoot a really bland vanilla version that you could do anything with, you know? And and it, it's crazy to me that they, they felt that they had to do it for that reason. Also, if you're talking a little bit of the disappointment of the last season overall, while I still, I still enjoy it, Jason Siegel's only in about half the season because yep. he said he didn't want to come back. They finally coerced him to come back. But uh, for the time they had him, that's why he's traveling to the wedding for most of the season mm. because they didn't have him with everybody else. And that really does hurt the flow of the show because they were an ensemble. But the finale, Jesus, just the way it ends, just it made it the rest of the show hurt so much that I'm not saying anything new here, but I'm just trying to say my pain is such that even thinking about it now, I can't bear to watch the rest of the show because I know how it ends. Anyway, that's my third. Any any thoughts for you? How I met your mother fan or am I just rambling to a to a brick yeah right i now. mean i would even <laughs> say that i felt like the last four to five episodes of that final season were like get on really? get on with it like i just uh, what wow. it, it what's the end game here like i just it felt i i can remember watching that i have to go back and see what the content was of those actual episodes but i can remember it being like third or three or four to go and that's how they just kind of kept promoting it to be like there's only four more how i met your mother's left and we're just like nothing happened. Like, what's going on here? Like, it was. It felt like one of those where it was just like filling in the the the, the blanks or like trying to 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 you know pull it out, stretch it out a little bit more. And um, uh, but no, I mean, I I really enjoyed the series. I I would be curious to go back and watch some of them just to see if I enjoyed it as much. I my my inclinations now, regardless of how the finale turned out, my thoughts of being annoyed with that is that some of it does not hold up great. Probably. Well, Barney's a sexual predator, and that doesn't play great. Right. Um, and just very much a joke that is really funny in 2011 or something like that. You know, right. like and just well and just doesn't yeah. isn't as uh, isn't as timeless or as aren't things that, like you said, Cheers. You can turn on, and I would say 90 to 95 percent of the jokes are still really funny regardless of even if they have some referential stuff to it. There's maybe like 5% of the jokes that are really specific to a moment in time, but um, it's, and, and maybe less than that. I know you love Cheers, so I might be speaking ill of that, but, <laughs> but, it, but, but it doesn't, I, there have been other shows that I think that you can watch. I'll that still do you. that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think Cheers is still perfect. I, no, fair. I brought that up. Well, no, I don't, it's not that it's not a perfect show. It's just that be, based on, I think when things are being written. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some that's definitely... All. I think that's a higher percentage on How I Met Your Mother. Like, I think that is, you know... No, the, I agree. A larger agree. percentage of their jokes makes sense in the moment that they're told, as opposed to 100%. 15 years later, which was... I, I would like to read you the DVD alternate ending synopsis right. from Wikipedia. And by the way, this clip's on YouTube for free. You can go find yep. it. Watch it after this. At Ted and the Mother's wedding, Barney and Robin nod to each other as future Ted's narration implies they later get back together. He then adds he believes he is lucky to wake up next to the mother every morning and cannot help but be amazed at how easy it all really was, recalling his former relationships and expressing incredulity. Incredulity? Incredulity? He's surprised at how allowing Barney and Robin to fall in love led him to fall in love at their wedding, leave early, and run into the mother. After Ted meeting the mother is shown... Future Ted narrates, see, easy. And that, kids, is how I met your mother. The mother doesn't die. He doesn't leave for Robin. It's just a really nice thing saying that even though Barney and Robin got divorced, they probably got back together. They focused, like, it's great. Yeah. It's better. <laughs> I, I'm with you. Uh, yeah, it's a fucking Ted. <laughs> what a douchebag. Yeah, agreed. But anyway... <laughs> 
<laughs> and even then, he was the worst. Yes. That said, we'll wrap it up. If anyone wants to reach out, if you know, give us a little feedback, positive, negative, whatever. Let me give you some different venues. Positive feedback only, please. Give us those five star reviews. Leave us some positive comments on, uh, you know, iTunes, Spotify, wherever. You want some negative feedback? You want to tell us to fuck off? Shoot me an email, Mike Barcode, M I K E B I R C O D E at gmail dot com. We'll read it on the show. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll really let you take us to task on air. It'll be fantastic. Mm. Social media, same thing. Mike Barcode, M I K E B A R C O D E. You can find me TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, anywhere. You can find full episodes of the show on YouTube if you're looking for a different venue. If you want this playing in the background while you do other things and you're trying to use your phone for something, go for it. Do that. That, that way to read friends pod page, I haven't updated in two months. There's five clips on it. Never touched it, but it's <laughs> out there. You know, whatever. Uh, that said, I think that'll do it for this week. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We'll, we'll be back next week. We've plotted out topics. I'm very excited for some of the stuff we got coming up. It's going to be a fun run over the next month or so. But with that, I will say goodbye and toss it over to Randy, who I, who I think may say something similar. I don't know. For usual, uh, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>